We are uh, fortunate to have our next speaker with us as well, um, Dr. Todd Bell. Uh, Dr. Bell is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Physicians, the Society of Hospital Medicine, the Infectious Disease Society of America, and the International Society for Influenza and Respiratory Viruses. Whew. In addition to his research and teaching efforts, Dr. Bell serves as local health authority for the Amarillo by City County Health District. His research interests include MRSA epidemiology, influenza, community health, inpatient care, and resident and medical student education. <sighs> Welcome, Dr. Bell. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And um, I think I need to update the um, uh, Texas Tech website just a little bit. The, um, uh, I'm actually not the um, uh, local health authority in Potter and Randall County. So if anybody has a question about tuberculosis, we can still, um, uh, we can still wing it. But officially, you need to see somebody else. The, um, um, I want to thank, just, just for a moment, thank the, uh, I appreciate it. Thank the um, uh, organizing group for letting me be able to come. And, um, um, and you know, one of the, the fundamental questions that, that I've had for, oh, I guess, uh, several, several months since um, uh, I was invited uh, was, why the heck do they want me to come? Um, and that may be the same question that you have after uh, the lovely introduction. You notice there was nothing in there about periodic paralysis. Um, and so uh, I'll explain in just a minute how we, um, uh, or, or what I do, and, and maybe I'll have something to be able to add to the conversation, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here and be able to learn from uh, the experts, uh, both our, our medical experts, uh, as well as the, the true patient experts, which are you all the patients. And, and uh, certainly I've learned a lot from uh, my own patients, um, uh, as well as, as being able to be here today. Um, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest. I've tried for years to get a kickback of any sort, and uh, so far no one's biting. Um, a second disclaimer is that, that my whole spiel that I'm going to do is uh, kind of predicated on something that I have absolutely zero hard data for. All I have is observations, um, and at the end of this, it may be 45 minutes of your time wasted, and if so, I truly apologize in advance. Um, it may be, though, that there's, there's again, some... Uh, piece or pearl that might be of um, utility to somebody. The third disclaimer that I have is that I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a geneticist, uh, I'm just an old country doctor. Um, and, uh, but several years ago I missed a committee meeting and um, uh, I was on vacation or something and I came back and lo and behold I'd gotten put in charge of uh, our pediatric department. I was the, the <laughs> regional chair and um, uh, I've been kicking at the goads for um, uh, about six years trying to get rid of that. But there's a time-honored tradition in medicine that when you join a new group that you, um, um, uh, everybody kind of gets together and gets their most difficult patients and they send them to whoever the new guy is. And so I started getting uh, these referrals from my own colleagues that I just had no idea what the heck to do with. These were just a um, uh, complete black box and mystery to me. And, um, and I had actually uh, two patients initially um, that uh, I got to thinking, boy, you know, I'm not sure what it is. I spent a lot of time scratching my head. I actually wore off, <laughs> wore off the top a little. Um, uh, I was thinking about them so hard. And, and I finally came up with um, uh, the idea that these patients had dysautonomia related to something called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And, um, but I didn't know how to treat them. I, I was kind of still at a loss. And so I thought, you know, if I had a half a dozen patients with dysautonomia, then I would really be able to do a good job and know what, what to do. So about two and a half years ago, I guess, maybe going on three, we actually opened up a hypermobility and dysautonomia clinic. And now I have oh, about 200 or so patients with hypermobility and dysautonomia, and I still have no idea what to do with them. But it turns out that some of those patients um, have uh, episodes of paralysis. And I actually um, uh, got to meet um, uh, one of my uh, uh, few adult patients. I usually don't see adults, but I have uh, a couple of adult patients, and one of those adult patients is actually a periodic paralysis patient and um, uh, had kind of introduced me to the, honestly introduced me to the concept of periodic paralysis, something beyond just the two lines that we learned in medical school. And uh, since then I've actually been um, 
blessed with being able to see a couple of other patients as well. But what struck me is that there seemed to be overlaps between a lot of different types of disease processes. And, and um, uh, just like our prior speaker was talking about how we have multiple episodic types of diseases that um, uh, may not be periodic paralysis, but maybe there's something we can learn about from that. Well, it turns out that a lot of my hypermobility patients have some symptoms that are similar to um, uh, uh, some of the symptoms that happen in uh, periodic paralysis as well. What I don't know and what I don't have any hard data for is whether um, uh, hypermobility is actually more common in patients with periodic paralysis. That's the assumption I'm making and that's why I may be wasting your time. But what we're going to try to do today is uh, take a couple minutes talking about a possible association between joint hypermobility and periodic paralysis and why we care and then also talk a little bit about um, management of two common hypermobility issues that may also be uh, problems in periodic paralysis. Um, so this is actually off the uh, PPA website. There's a, um, a little caveat there. After talking about symptoms of periodic paralysis, uh, it says that some signs and symptoms noted at the PPA conference, obviously this was from last year or prior year's PPA conference, uh, may also be part, that, that may also be part of familial uh, hypokalemic uh, periodic paralysis, um, but have not been formally validated. And that's really sort of the key there. So if you look, those, those uh, symptoms that are listed on the PPA website are things like migraines and heart rhythm abnormalities, uh, ADD or ADHD, uh, insensitivity to local anesthetics, uh, severe um, uh, menstrual cramping, um, uh, pain, muscle cramps. If you actually go to the medical literature and you start looking for those other symptoms, which is kind of what we're going to talk a little bit about today, uh, I can find nothing in the medical literature on those other symptoms uh, categories. And, and, um, uh, and that's really where you as the, um, uh, the experts in this disease, as the patients, uh, can really help, I think, inform uh, us as, as uh, medical practitioners, uh, as well as the, the medical experts in the room, as to um, uh, what some of those other things are. There have been a couple of things that I've observed just in the um, uh, handful of PP patients that uh, I take care of. Um, those would be things like the headaches, palpitations, uh, joint pain, um, insomnia, diarrhea, or constipation, uh, sometimes back and forth, never both at the same time. Um, uh, abdominal pain, anxiety or irritability, um, uh, painful menstrual cycles, joint hypermobility, of course, and difficulty thinking clearly. Now, when I compare that to what my hypermobility with dysautonomia patients have, uh, lo and behold, there's kind of similar things. We've got uh, headache, we have palpitations, we have joint pain, muscle pain, uh, difficulty sleeping at night, um, uh, tinnitus, um, uh, again, belly issues, anxiety, uh, PMS-type issues, um, uh, abnormal bleeding, um, um, uh, and I would also say that I have a higher rate of DVT uh, in uh, my hypermobility patients I'm not sure if that's an issue or not, but uh, I know at least one of my uh, PP patients has also had issues with DVTs. Uh, difficulty thinking clearly, syncope, and then insensitivity, insensitivity again to lidocaine. So as we start kind of looking through there, lo and behold, there's some things that do seem to potentially overlap just a little bit. And, um, uh, and that then gives this, this question of, all right, is there some overlap? And I don't know what the amount of overlap is on this Venn diagram. Again, there's nothing in the literature that I can find. And oftentimes, in most disease processes, we don't go around looking for hypermobility unless it's a musculoskeletal problem, right? So if someone keeps um, uh, throwing their shoulder out of joint, then maybe we check and see whether they've got uh, joint hypermobility. But if uh, someone's coming in for migraines, then we don't usually check to see if, they have, if they're hypermobile. Um, but hypermobility is a pretty common thing, and um, about 10% of, um, uh, uh, and that's actually reversed, I'm sorry, I typed that in wrong. About 20% uh, of women and about 10% of men have joint hypermobility, uh, which is just kind of biology. It's a bell curve, of course, that um, uh, you could say that 10% uh, of uh, the population is taller than the other 90%. Uh, that's just a true statement. But what we see is that in those uh, 10 to 20 percent that are hypermobile, that they're significantly more likely to have other issues as well. They're more likely to have, uh, for example, chronic fatigue syndrome. About 80 percent of patients with um, chronic fatigue syndrome have um, uh, joint hypermobility, have an abnormal um, amount of movement. Fibromyalgia is another one. Uh, there's actually a long list of things that seem to be more common 
uh, or that, that seem to, that the patients with these other diseases are more likely to be hypermobile. Again, CFS, um, uh, Chiari malformations, uh, not that we're exactly sure what a Chiari is anymore. Uh, I used to know, and then I started trying to read about it, and um, I think the definition's changing. Um, POTS, if anybody's heard of that, um, that's a, another, uh, or it's one specific type of dysautonomia, and we'll go in and explain what dysautonomia is in a minute, too. Uh, eosinophilia, uh, Job syndrome, um, again, issues with uh, gut motility, idiopathic growth hormone deficiency, vocal cord dysfunction, mast cell dysregulation, lupus. There's, um, uh, those patients are more likely to have joint hypermobility than what the uh, general population is. Um, so this is not necessarily something that's entirely unique to periodic paralysis, but again, maybe in a minute I'll be able to um, um, explain why I think it, it may be worthwhile to at least mention. So one sort of fundamental thought is that there's a lot of people that are hypermobile, and then there's um, uh, these uh, islands of disease that uh, just seem to occur more commonly in folks who have joint hypermobility. Now, joint hypermobility just means that we have a, um, a little bit of different uh, deposition of collagen so that the joints are actually obviously more mobile, that uh, uh, it's easier for people to bend their arms back, their hands back. Uh, one of the questions I ask kids is if, uh, when I first see them for the first time, is if they're able to um, uh, have any tricks that they impress their friends with. And, um, uh, and it's impressive what all that the kids can do. I mean, they can, uh, it's not just putting their feet behind their heads. Sometimes it's as um, uh, simple as that. I have one kid who can stretch his lower lip up over his nose. Um, uh, he didn't want to do it initially, and uh, it just seemed to be too good of an opportunity, so I gave him a dollar if he would do it. And um, then he was so excited about it, doing it that he um, I kept doing it, and I'm like, man, you got to stop. And so I paid him another dollar, uh, paid him another dollar to stop. But this idea of this abnormal collagen, and again, there's a lot of things that um, are related to that. So when we think about what is joint hypermobility, what we classically use is something called the Baton score. It's not the only clinical score out there, but it's about, um, there's um, um, uh, nine different points you can get. Um, it's uh, pretty simple to do. You basically bend your finger back. Uh, I do not have joint hypermobility, but you bend your finger back. If your pinky finger can go back uh, past 90 degrees, uh, that's a point. You get points for each side. Uh, you can bend your thumb down and sort of crossing it like this, and if you can touch your wrist, or sorry, if your, your uh, thumb can touch your, um, um, uh, your forearm, then that gets you two points. If you bend your elbow back and it goes further than uh, about 185 degrees, then that gets you uh, two points. Again, one point for each side. Um, same with the knees. That gets you up to eight points. And then the final thing is if you can reach down and um, uh, put your hands on the floor, uh, actually your palms on the floor without bending your knees, then that's a uh, point as well. So it gives you a total of of nine points, um, I routinely score zero on this, and um, uh, I have to get a, um, uh, a boot strap actually to reach my, my boot. So I definitely don't have the personal experience with that. But the, um, uh, there's a little bit of debate in the literature. Usually we say, well, between a score of about four or five, depending on who you talk to, or higher, is significantly hypermobile, is more hypermobile than, than what we would anticipate the average adult would, um, uh, would be. And again, here I actually got it right. 10% of men, 20% of women. And then if you think about it, kids, you know, you take a newborn, man, you can tie them into a pretzel and um, uh, stick them in a shoebox. You shouldn't, but um, as a pediatrician, I'm, you shouldn't. But you could, right? Because the, um, uh, the joints are significantly mobile. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, if you have someone who's 85 or 90, it's much less likely they're going to do the splits and be able to stand afterwards at that age than they were when they were younger. So one of the problems with this scoring system is that the, um, uh, we all tend to get a little stiffer with age. We're just a little less flexible as we get older. Um, but the, um, it's the score that we've got, and so it's what we typically use. Now, there are some things that are classically associated with joint hypermobility. Um, if you, if, at least when I've looked at like blogs related to periodic paralysis, there oftentimes seems to be discussion of Ehlers-Danlos, specifically a hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos. Um, the, uh, there's other things as well. There is something called benign joint hypermobility syndrome, which uh, best I can tell is the exact same thing as uh, Ehlers-Danlos hypermobile type. Um, and, um, uh, and I think that's, that's kind of becoming the, the, the common um, perception as well. But 
Aside from those, um, um, those known syndromes and the other associations, um, our question here, of course, is, is hypermobility more common in periodic paralysis? And, and the short answer is, is that I have no idea. Um, I have met more folks with periodic paralysis today uh, than I've met in the prior 43 years of my life. So, um, and I wasn't looking then. Um, so I, I don't know. There's just not anything out there in the literature on. It's definitely something that would be actually a fairly easy thing to be able to evaluate. A absolutely. Well, we absolutely can't. So one thing I'd actually like to do, and I was trying to get it done and, and through the IRB before I, I came out, but I uh, was actually doing a survey and trying to look at uh, if people could anonymously submit what their genetic mutation is and then also what, um, um, uh, what their Baton score is. But does anybody, how many folks just feel like that they're probably double-jointed or when they were a kid they were double-jointed or hypermobile? So that's probably a third, maybe a fourth, something like that. Okay. So the um, um, again, it, it's it's interesting, and I don't know how much of an overlap there is on that Venn diagram where you start looking at how much do um, uh, how much does it affect people with periodic paralysis. Did you do? do look at that. That is right. Now, now, can you do that with the tail and the uh, and the ears? There we go. There we go. That's it right there. That that's why we're talking. Can you strap your lip up over your nose? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Someone get some tape. We'll see if we can. Um, so so what are uh, you know we, we talked about all those symptoms that happen in folks with uh, hypermobility and and there's there's both direct effects of collagen. Um, uh, laxity, and then there's uh, other things that may be more indirect effects. Uh, the direct effects, certainly joint pain, it just makes sense that if you got a little more wobble in your knees when you're walking, then um, uh, over time you're going to have a little more damage to the, uh, uh, to the articular cartilage, the muscle's going to have to work harder, and so again, some of that increase in joint pain. The um, um, dislocations are, are pretty obvious. I've got a, um, uh, a woman, again, I said I don't usually see adult patients, but I had a lady from Kansas who was, um, uh, would, had gotten my email address, and, and she'd called up and was wanting to make an appointment, and man, we're booked out until, I don't know, it was six months or so for new patients in the, in the hypermobility clinic, and, and I told her, I said, ma'am, I just, I just don't see uh, adults very often, I really just, just see kids now, and um, so she started sending me selfies of um, uh, uh, things that she was popping out of joint, and and so like, she'd send a picture of her, of her shoulder in the mirror, and then she'd pop it out of socket, and she'd take another picture, and then she'd send it off to me. And so for about a uh, probably week and a half or so, about every other day, I got a picture of a different joint. And uh, some of them getting a little risque, and I was kind of afraid my wife was going to look on the email. And, and so I said, all right, you know, tell you what, you come on down, and, and we're going to see you in clinic, but you got to stop sending me pictures. We just got to cut that out. So, yeah, so... Dislocations, that's pretty obvious that that would go along with joint laxity. Uh, easy bleeding, um, uh, it's kind of interesting, in spite of kind of normal coags, um, uh, that's actually a direct collagen effect, we think. It actually has to do with platelet activation, uh, that the platelets just don't activate well. So I routinely have patients that they'll go to the dentist, and then the dentist calls me afterwards and said, man, that was the scariest thing. I didn't, never thought that kid would stop bleeding. And, you know, kid has normal coags, has normal platelet function assays, but the issue is the collagen itself is somehow different. So if you actually do a bleeding time, it comes back abnormal sometimes. The headache part of it, I don't know if it's a direct effect or not. There's a uh, debate about, you know, vascular spasm, like we might potentially see in migraines, and I certainly am not going to go into headache pathology with a bunch of neurologists in the room. Um, but, but there's also things, you know, potential for uh, occipital nerve irritation, which classically causes a frontal or frontal occipital headache, so for front and back headache, um, that may actually happen because of um, uh, stabilization of the cervical spine. Uh, so it's truly actually a cervicogenic headache uh, or even excessive muscle contraction to stabilize, giving more of a tension headache. Uh, and then some debate, of course, about dynamic alterations in spinal fluid flow, like what we see in, in patients who have Chiari, if you're familiar with that, um, and um, uh, some of the debate that's that um, uh, no reason to open up that can of worms, but some of the debate about Chiari's as well. Out of curiosity, who all in here has either been evaluated for Chiari or was... was uh, is, is anybody actually even know what that? We, we, 
we got a couple. Okay, your daughter. All right, and and um, I'm guessing that your bait and score was was um, uh, if you were testing yourself. Uh, are you pretty flexible? Yeah, my daughter is. She's already been diagnosed. Okay. All right. Okay. So yeah, so the Chiari and the hypermobility um, go hand in hand, and and it's interesting. Well, like I said I'm not going to open up that can of worms of a Chiari, but but there's again these other associations. There's also indirect effects that can happen, and and one of them is this this concept of dysautonomia. Now, dysautonomia, as we think about the the um, central nervous system, um, we have things that are under our control. So I can, if I'm wanting to uh, uh, pick my nose or um, um, uh, wave at my my wife. Um, I'm basically telling my, my body to do that, and it's following that conscious control. Uh, on the other hand, there's things that I don't tell my body to do, and it does it anyways, right? So if, it's, um, uh, if I'm nervous speaking in front of a big group and I start sweating in the armpits, well, I didn't tell myself to sweat. The um, body's kind of doing that automatically. Uh, same way with um, uh, if, if a uh, bear walks into the room, uh, my heart rate's going to go up, uh, my pupils are going to get wider, I may look a little pale, I uh, may look a little flushed, um, belly's going to feel a little funny, might even pee, and um, uh, bear might too, I guess, but, um, but the, um, the take-home point is that there's things that, that happen that we're not consciously thinking of, and those are, we kind of lump it in, at least in my layman's perspective, into the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system then has two components to it. You have a sympathetic, which is kind of the fight-or-flight response that we're all familiar with and have heard about, and then there's the parasympathetic, which is um, sort of the opposite of that. So if you want to, you can think of it as the veg and chill response, uh, that um, uh, postprandial coma that you develop uh, at uh, Thanksgiving um, uh, is a, um, a parasympathetic-driven uh, state of mind. On the other hand, again, a bear walking into the room, that would be sympathetic or fight or flight. So dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, basically that's what dysautonomia is, is that we just have abnormalities in the um, uh, regulation of the autonomic nervous system. Not that there's a problem necessarily in the end organ. It's not that the adrenal glands are bad or that the, um, uh, the, the heart is, is um, um, uh, bad in, in dysautonomia, but rather that the regulation is the problem. So you can kind of look, uh, again, just think about what would happen if a bear walks in the room, and that's pretty much the types of things that we might have, uh, anticipate with dysautonomia. So when we think about um, then um, um, uh, what are some of the triggers for the sympathetic side of things, that fight or flight, obviously the fear or startle, the um, uh, interestingly exercise, uh, cold exposure. Actually, there was some um, discussion earlier about cold and, and somewhat different than um, um, the, um, um, uh, the paramyotonia congenita where, where we're, we're having muscles cool, I think that there may actually be some stress response just from cold exposure. Back in the 50s, um, I wasn't around then, but my understanding was that um, uh, we had a whole period where we were going through trying to predict who was going to develop high blood pressure when they were adults, and the way we were doing this was by dunking the kids' uh, hands in cold water, um, kind of ice water, about 10 degrees uh, Celsius, and, and uh, we called it a cold presser test, and, and it turns out that if you do that enough times, the kid may not develop high blood pressure, but they'll definitely develop a, uh, an aversion to doctors. Um, so <laughs> it kind of went, um, uh, went out of style in doing that for that purpose, but we actually still use it as a, that cold presser test as a uh, marker of or a, a uh, standardized uh, sympathetic nervous system stimulus, um, especially if you're doing um, uh, sort of poor man's autonomic nervous system testing. So cold exposure, uh, glucose changes, positional changes, infection, um, interestingly, barometric pressure changes. That was something else that kind of came up. Um, the, um, and you see there's a question mark there. I've got nothing in the literature. Um, but man, when we have a storm front coming through West Texas, and of course, in, if y'all been to West Texas, we have three trees and we space them out <laughs> about, about 75 miles apart. So when a wind gets going, if it makes it past that first one up around um, uh, text line or so, it's just going to sweep on through until it gets to about Dallas. So when we have a pressure change come through or a storm coming through, oftentimes it's a very significant uh, barometric pressure change. And when that happens, my phone just lights up. And um, I have colleagues that, uh, you know, headache specialists that they talk about the headache season in the, um, uh, in the springtime. Uh, when they're just worn out from all the, the headaches that are being triggered. Uh, there's something, I think, that's going on there. 
And in our patients with um, uh, dysautonomia, that seems to be one of the triggers that happen. And then again, pretty much anything that can cause stress. Um, so again, bear walks into the room, we all have physiology that occurs. So typically those sympathetic flares are going to, again, be those symptoms that you would have if a bear walked into the room. I'm going to need to actually fly through because I think I'm already uh, running out of time. Um, real quickly, the, I have, like the rest of my talk, no data to back this up. Uh, and I certainly don't want anybody to go out and be doing anything based off what I'm going to say over the next couple of slides. But um, as far as possible, periodic paralysis, dysautonomic connections, one thought is that, um, uh, for example, um, uh, Dr. Cannon had a, um, uh, a new um, actual pump that was, uh, the mutation was discovered that he had mentioned, I think you said the, the paper came out yesterday. Um, I am not that up much up on the literature. So, so um, but, but again, the, the idea being that um, there may be other types of mutations that actually affect more tissue uh, than just um, the muscle. Uh, second thought uh, would be that um, uh, as patients have, if they have both um, uh, hypermobility with dysautonomia and then they also have um, um, uh, periodic paralysis, we've mentioned several times about how that adrenal uh, gland release, how that, that adrenaline or, or epinephrine or catecholamines, um, that that can actually cause changes in your serum potassium. Uh, and it may very well be that if we have abnormal autonomic nervous system regulation, then we're developing these small potassium changes that are actually resulting in more symptoms. Uh, then the third thought is that uh, could there actually be some patients, and again, I, I've got uh, gene negative there in quotes because we don't know what all things are going to still be found as far as other channels or other pumps. Um, but uh, could we actually have uh, some direct nerve damage, and we have patients that have um, paralytic events, um, that are um, uh, episodic, that are actually related to uh, nerve stress. This is actually an MRI of a, um, um, uh, it's actually an MRI of a young lady that I see, but, but uh, it's because I couldn't get the uh, hospital computer to spit out the MRI of the kid I was wanting to show. Um, but um, pretend this is a little boy, I bet y'all aren't going to be able to tell the difference. And 13-year-old boy that came in, basically um, uh, sudden onset of uh, weakness, um, flaccid paralysis, um, uh, diagnosed with GBS, but lots of debate because didn't really have the typical um, uh, CSF findings that we might anticipate. And the um, um, uh, and MRI was read out as normal, but, and I don't know if you can see this, if you actually look at this portion of the, um, of the, the spine here, this is actually called the cervical, or sorry, this is the C2 and uh, our second cervical vertebra, and up here at the top, this bone right here is called the dens. Uh, sometimes we call it the odontoid, and up here is the uh, first cervical vertebra. And that den sticks up like a thumb in the ring of the first cervical vertebra, and that's what allows your head to tilt, or sorry, allows your head to rotate. And um, that's held in place by the same kind of collagen that you might find in your wrist or in your pinky. So if it's flexible, it wouldn't be surprising then that uh, that dens might actually be able to retroflex or push back a little bit, which then there's some data that uh, Fraser Henderson's done a great job, I think, of um, um, uh, putting together into a uh, paper, at least as a hypothesis, uh, back in 2010, talking about deformational stressors that occur in the uh, cervical spine based off of either um, uh, basically the retroflexion of the den, either measured by something called a Grab Oaks measurement or a PBC2, or also um, uh, looking at it from the standpoint of clival angle. Anyhow, so normal is actually in kids should be about uh, four to six, and this kid's measurement, I realize it's difficult to see there, is about uh, between 10 and 11, um, suggesting that uh, there is some abnormal uh, movement there. And then actually in uh, Fraser's paper, he, um, uh, they did some mathematical modeling to give an idea of what stressors there were. So if you were to actually cut through the brainstem at this level, uh, what you'd find is that those places where there's orange are places that there's more stress, green there's less stress, again modeled based off of the amount of retroflexion of that dens and the potential for deformational stress in the uh, cervical spine. All right, so um, um, enough with speculation. I wanted to just mention two things really quickly. Uh, one of them is um, uh, the joint pain. Um, again, we talked about how that joint laxity can result in microtrauma. Um, and then the other thing is that the body tends to adjust to adjust the gait in our movements to try to relieve stress on damaged joints. And so that ends up causing compensatory problems 
Um, so if you don't believe me, just um, uh, stick a, um, oh, put about a, a half inch heel lift in one of your shoes and walk around uh, at uh, uh, Disney World or something like that for a day. And what you're going to find is you're not hurting just in your heel, you're hurting in your, your knee and your other knee and your hips are hurting, your back's hurting. And all that's because the body's trying to compensate for that abnormality that's, that's occurred. You can also get the macro trauma where we have repetitive um, dislocations uh, and uh, like in the lady that I mentioned a little earlier. So how do we manage that? Well, one thing, we want to keep people out of uh, rugby and pole vaulting. And, and uh, so those of y'all that were uh, considering uh, pole vaulting um, as a, as a uh, recreational choice, I'd encourage you to maybe do something else if you have joint hypermobility. Um, on the other hand, those things that are habitual muscle toning exercises, um, I think those are great. That helps to reinforce the joint and be able to decrease uh, some of the, um, uh, the strain on the ligaments. Uh, if you get a joint sprain, you've got to treat it seriously. You don't just try to walk it off. It takes longer for that to be able to heal. Uh, and then also, I'm a strong proponent of uh, physical therapy, and there's actually some data on this um, in joint hypermobility and EDS, of, uh, uh, especially if you have trigger joints. So places that you've had recurrent dislocations, um, then we want to be able to strengthen those muscles as best we can. From an orthotic standpoint, people always want to brace stuff. The downside of that is if it's a muscular joint, you can brace it up and lose all your muscle, and then when you take your brace off, you got problems. I got a little boy that I saw the first time about a year ago. Uh, he had been put in a uh, rigid cervical collar about two and a half years prior to that and had somehow missed uh, his follow-ups for two and a half years. And so the poor kid came in, and, and um, man, he had no more muscle on his neck than a piece of linguine. And um, uh, so we've been trying to work our way back to uh, re-strengthening that neck there. Uh, and so, again, we've got to be cautious with orthotics, but there's definitely some times that they're really helpful, especially in places that are difficult to do physical therapy, like in your fingers or your uh, wrists. Um, POTS, again, is just another, type of or another word for dysautonomia. I would point out this is dynamic, not static. This isn't Parkinson's disease. Um, the, the type of dysautonomia that we have associated with joint hypermobility tends to come and go. And this is, again, not something that's in the literature, but I'll have a patient who has a 52-point rise in their heart rate when they see me in, in clinic if they go from a line to a standing position. I see them back two weeks later. I haven't done anything to them. Um, they're just as hydrated as they were before, and now they've got a 14-point um, uh, rise in their heart rate. It's a dynamic process. Um, mainly we depend on catecho catecholamine blockades. Uh, it already been mentioned, beta blockers for other reasons. Uh, propranolol, I typically use the uh, non-cardiac selective because sometimes I can get other benefits, uh, for example, with headaches or anxiety. Um, the, uh, with uh, clonidine, that's a different type of um, uh, catecholamine um, uh, attenuator, um, but basically it works centrally and it can be great uh, if you have insomnia along with dysautonomia. Um, there's certainly midodrine that's out there. Uh, if primarily they're cardiovascular symptoms about dizziness or palpitations, it's a great drug. It doesn't help with other things like potentially headache or others. Um, there's a, a newer medicine called Avabradine, which is actually a funnel, funny channel blocker. Um, without going into why, that's a um, uh, funny thing. Um, it uh, does seem to actually have some benefit, at least in two small um, uh, open label retrospective studies. Um, it seemed to have some improvement in fatigue, which is oftentimes a big issue with, with POTS. We also encourage people to make sure they drink a lot. Um, again, if you can tolerate the salt load, then we want to do um, uh, sports drinks. If you can't tolerate the salt load, if that's a trigger, then obviously you'd avoid that. Cooling vests or warming vests are actually really helpful, and a lot of people get um, uh, better um, endurance if they have a cooling vest. This is one of my patients that you can see how that would slide right under her uh, regular clothes without too much difficulty. She goes to school and nobody knows that she's got it. Um, biofeedback is actually something that um, uh, there's a little bit of uh, data on and, and a lot of patients say that it can be really helpful. Um, and with that, I realize I am past my time and I do apologize. Um, um, I'm just kind of leaving a little bit with the, um, this is actually a poem that um, uh, a young lady that had written, and, um, uh, and she said that we could use it. But, and she doesn't actually have uh, uh, periodic paralysis, um, um, but she's got um, uh, one of those uncommon diseases that it's really difficult to find a doctor uh, who is uh, willing to kind of listen to her and be able to hear what she's having to say. So I'll stop with that. I know that it's difficult to read, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that I could. Yes,
you'd mentioned uh, early about potentially getting information from people. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so the idea of these registries makes sense. Is that something that has ever been formally put forward or currently there's any idea on putting that forward that would have information like gene mutations and stuff like that? Um, I, I think that, uh, you, that I tried to do that with uh, Patrick Cochran way back in 98, uh, and that kind of fell flat. Um, I, I don't know if uh, Invite wants to, is there anyone from Strongbridge who wants to comment on their thing a little? So as an extension of the genetic testing program that we're providing alongside Invite, we are looking at um, creating something called the Patient Insights Network, which would be an opportunity to create a registry globally, even for past samples that have been done. So that is something that we're actually working through the next couple of weeks, and hopefully by uh, early next year, if not by end of this year, we'll actually start collecting data to formalize a unified registry. I mean, I, I think that, you know, one of the hopes is to take, you know, all... The, the, the dream, the dream of, uh, of myself as a PPA president is to get all of the patient samples of every medical advisor who each has their cohort of 100 or 200 PP patients and dump them all in one centralized registry and then be able to start working on stuff and then we can really get some traction. But uh, I, I think even the cohorts that, that they have, uh, if any one individual researcher went and tapped back into their genetically identified uh, group and asked the right questions, you can, you can leverage some good information, such as what we're doing here, what we're finding here. I, I think that, in, in, you know, registries are significant uh, tools. I mean, they're just uh, amazing, especially for uncommon diseases. I think that one of the, the, um, uh, the caveats, and we've, we've struggled a little bit with the different registry that have worked on, is um, uh, for something called Burke Barrel, which is, um, best I can tell, there's like four kids in the U.S., but um, trying to put together a, 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 a registry to sort of link in some of the international, and, and that's trying to build it flexible enough that we can um, uh, add um, data as, as new things become evident, um, because uh, especially early on as we think about things, and, and I realize that, you know, we've got certainly a lot more expertise on periodic paralysis than we do on, on some other diseases, but um, uh, sometimes we don't know what the right question is to ask, and so I think sometimes casting a really broad net, that makes the, the, the database potentially more, um, uh, or the registry more cumbersome, and it's a little more difficult to, you know, get the pediatrician to sit down and say, okay, well, here's the 78 questions that I'm going to have to answer here. But on the other hand, um, it's a lot easier to do that at the beginning than it is to go back and, and ask somebody, boy, do you remember when you were six years old, if you ever, you know, whatever the, um, uh, the new symptom or, or association uh, that comes to light. It's nice in some ways with the biologic samples because there we have this, this static phenomenon and we know that we can, we've, we've got it. Um, but with clinical data, I think that it, building in some flexibility or casting a very broad net initially might be helpful. Yes, ma'am. I know it changes. Oh. A total change of subject here. But I was going back to your talk. And one of the things that our doctor has said um, who diagnosed our periodic paralysis was that our prior diagnosis of dysautonomia was actually secondary to the periodic paralysis. His theory is that the electrolyte, the chronic electrolyte instability um, is, you know, triggering the autonomic dysfunction. I just wanted to see what you thought of that. Yep, maybe. <laughs> I, 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 I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, there's, there's very much a chicken egg question here. Right. And um, uh, throughout, I, I do, um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of just a dilettante. I don't have any expertise in anything. So I do some contract work on tuberculosis for the state of Texas. And um, uh, just for Jollies one time, I spent over a three-month period uh, I just checked all my tuberculosis patients who had um, uh, come in for TB. I just did a bait and score on them. It turns out that 60% of my active TB patients um, actually have uh, an abnormal bait and score. So then the question is, all right, what's the chicken, what's the egg? Right. Is it that um, uh, inflammation, for example, we're trying to do a study, and, and if anybody's good at um, uh, stretching mouse ACLs, you, you got mice. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to stretch mice ACLs. We give the mice gingivitis. And then we actually check to see if that changes collagen laxity. Um, wow. and it turns out a mouse ACL is much smaller than I thought. And so I am in, uh, stuck in uh, trying to dissect this thing out. 
but the um, um, what was I talking about? Oh, TB. So the um, the point is that um, uh, is it that the patient has TB that causes inflammation? The inflammation causes the joints to be more relaxed, so they're hypermobile. Or is it something about joint hypermobility that predisposes people? Something about the collagen that predisposes them to the um, uh, to the tuberculosis, and I think that that uh, it's an open question, and at least not until I can figure out how to stretch a mouse ACL. Um, and I think that in some ways there would be the that same question right now with periodic paralysis versus dysautonomia. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. There's just again, there's zero data that I'm aware of. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Is, any, any other questions? Or, uh... Thank you, Dr. Bell. Right. I, I think. I, that was that was awesome. You're awesome. Thank you so much for thank you. Speaking. you know, I, I think what, one of the unmet needs in in our community is finding uh, pediatricians who are willing to take patients, and honestly, finding any physician who's willing to take the oddball patient instead of saying, you know what, it's not my area. I don't want to get sued. See someone else. So you know, thank you for being open to you know seeing oddball cases. That's great. <laughs>